We're now halfway through Smash Bros. second season of DLC, and after the Sephiroth reveal, it's safe to say there's still plenty of surprises coming and anyone is on the table. And I know everyone has their personal favorites. Everyone has that number one pick, whether it be Dante, or Waluigi, or Sora, or Goku, but I'm here today to say forget all those! Those picks are silly and weird! Sora in Smash Bros? A character with the power to go to different worlds in a crossover game? That's just crazy talk! No, I've got the true number one best pick. Ladies and gentlemen, today I am here to reveal to you that the number one greatest pick for a new Smash Bros. character is Viridian. Yeah. Viridian. No? Nobody's going to join me on this? You know, Viridian. The tiny pixel guy from V. It's spelled with six V's. It's like a puzzle platformer with anti-gravity elements, and you know what? If y'all ain't gonna understand the brilliance of putting obscure indie game characters into Smash Bros, then I'll just do it myself. Welcome to another episode of Build the Roster, the show where we take a hypothetical fighting game and build our dream roster around it. However, today's episode is going to be a little different because it's going to be the most hypothetical of any game we've ever done. You see, normally on this show we focus on sequels to existing franchises, but today we're going to build a totally new game from the ground up. And by from the ground up, I mean I'm going to completely rip off another game just with different characters. Alright, let me give you all some backstory on how we got here. I love video games, and I'm certainly a fan of big AAA massive releases with their cutting edge graphics and hundreds of hours of side quests, but I also love indie games. Those games made by the smaller studios, the passion projects, the nostalgic throwbacks, and the genre breaking trailblazers. And over the past few years, indie games have exploded, producing award-winning series with dynamic characters that have planted their flags in our hearts. I would actually argue that some of the most memorable video game characters of the past five years have actually come from these smaller games. And you know me, anytime that you give me beloved memorable characters, I immediately want to see them fight each other. In this cozy management game, make some lasting memories before you have to say a final farewell to those not long for this world. Let them fight. And I'm not the only one. There have been numerous fighting games over the years that have taken these indie characters and pitted them against each other. And some of them have been pretty darn good. But none of them really scratched that itch for me. There was Blade Strangers, which had some pretty good mechanics and some decent sprite work, and they even got a few big names like Shovel Knight. But the majority of the rest of the cast is so obscure that if you go to their Wikipedia page, it's just a picture of a guy shrugging. Brawl Out has a good number of big name guest characters, but they're just guest characters. I want a game that's built around these characters, not built around other characters, and then we just happen to get the indie co-stars in there. Indie Pogo actually has a great starring roster, but it's a gimmick fighter. It's a fighting game where you're constantly jumping. Don't get me wrong, the game is super fun, and if you're looking for something different, then check it out. It gets a big thumbs up from me, but I want something more straightforward. And Bounty Battle? Well, it's got easily the best roster of any indie, indie crossover game so far. It's got a more standard playstyle. It's even got a great opening cinematic. Holy cow, this game might actually be exactly what I'm looking for. Why aren't more people talking about this game? Oh. Oh no. Oh no! Oh no! Yeah, so it looks like my dream indie crossover fighting game will never exist. Well, if that's the case, then screw it. I'll do it myself. And by do it myself, I mean I'll make a YouTube video about it, and that's about it. So today on Build the Roster, I present you Indie Smash, the ultimate indie game crossover. Yes, today we're going to pretend like some crazy eccentric rich person who just watches YouTube videos all day decides to hire us to make a fighting game for them and we can grab up whatever characters we want. 
And Nintendo decides to turn a blind eye to the fact that we're basically just going to rip off Smash Bros. Yeah, I'm not going to go into too many details about it because, well, we're here for the roster, not for the mechanics of a fictional game. But if I did have to come up with the dream fighting game for all these indie characters, I think Smash Bros has the perfect formula right there. The moment that Shovel Knight popped up in Smash Bros Ultimate as an assist trophy, I realized, oh, this is exactly how an indie crossover game should play. It really is the format that allows the most variety in playstyles, and when you're talking about indie games, you're talking about variety. When you create a game that allows Mario, Terry Bogart, and Minecraft Man all to fight in a way that makes you say, yeah, this all fits together, it's exactly what we need for the cast that we put together today. Plus, a fun party-style platform fighter allows each character to stay true to their own design and mechanics. We've already seen what happens when you try to put too many characters from too wide of a spectrum into a game with a shared aesthetic. Remember Blade Strangers from earlier? Yeah, here's Shovel Knight in that game. Look at what they did to my boy! Look at how they stretched this dude out to make him fit in with the rest of this cast. And don't even get me started on how insane and unsettling Isaac from Binding of Isaac looks when you put him in here. So yeah, Smash style party platform fighters with items and assist characters and stages with hazards up the wazoo, that's the plan here. Now before we can put this roster together, we have to decide how many characters our game is going to have. And you know what? What the heck? If we're taking inspiration from Smash Bros, let's look to them for the answer. The first Smash Bros game had 12 characters in it, which was fine for 20 years ago, but today we need more. So let's move on down the timeline a little until we get to Smash Bros. Melee, which is largely considered to be one of the best fighting game sequels of all time. And a lot of that has to do with the mechanics, but it's also thanks to the fact that this game's roster exploded. It went from the initial size of 12 up to more than double that with 25. Although Zelda could transform into two different characters, so technically it was more of 26, but... Then again, there were also a handful of characters introduced in this game who were simple copy and paste echo fighters of pre-existing characters which we would not be able to reproduce for this game since it's the very first in a brand new installment, so I guess we should probably take a couple of those characters off and god, Smash rosters are so hard to figure out. Screw it! 24! We're saying it's 24! And you ask me, for the first installment in a giant crossover game where each character will come from a different franchise? 24 sounds perfect! It sounds like you could get a massive variety of characters while still just barely managing to not fall off the edge of Mount Too Big to be feasible. But now that we have our size established, let's talk about what characters we can actually use. Yeah, I'm sure somebody out there has been asking this whole time, what exactly do you mean by indie game? Which is a good question. I mean, Wikipedia defines indie games as a video game typically created by individuals or smaller development teams without the financial and technical support of a large game publisher. Which might seem like a big no-duh, but a lot of people out there are going to have different opinions on what counts as a smaller development team. A guy making a game by himself in his basement? Yeah, that's totally indie. But a small team that over time has gotten bigger and bigger projects, even working alongside major studios? Well, do they still count? Or what about all the small indie companies that have been bought up by Microsoft? Over the past couple of years, they've gone nuts buying up whatever indie company they can get their hands on, so are they still technically an indie company if Microsoft now has some money invested in them? And don't even get me started on studios like Ninja Theory, which refer to themselves as AAA Indie Studios. Whatever the hell that means. Listen, I'm not going to get into a big metaphysical debate over what the heart and soul of an indie studio is, but let's just say I considered a lot of different angles on each character on this list, so hopefully we made something that everyone can be happy with. What am I saying? This is the internet. No one's going to be happy with this. Hopefully we made something that will upset the least number of people. However, even after deciding if a game counts as an indie game, that still didn't mean every character was up for this roster. I am a big believer that any character can be in a fighting game. Nothing is off limits. But when I actually had to put my money where my mouth was on that theory, yeah, I had to put down some limits. There are some characters that no matter how popular they might be, I just couldn't make them work in this game. Tons of indie games strike a chord with audiences because they're all about emotional journeys and personal discoveries, which can make them truly moving and important pieces. But it also means their characters aren't exactly suited for punching and kicking people. When choosing characters, I always had to ask three questions. 
How popular is the character? How important are they to the indie game community? And what moves or abilities could they actually have in a fighting game? And some characters excelled in those first two questions, but sadly fell flat in the third. Also, I did say that for this hypothetical game, we're pretending someone is giving us enough money to buy up whatever characters we want, but even then, there's some characters where money isn't the problem, and in the interest of having a shred of reality here, I will be taking behind the scenes complications into consideration. For example, let's say there's a great game out there with a character that would fit right in here, but the developer behind the game is known for being... Mm, hard to work with. Yeah, let's go with that. Just to give a recent example, I absolutely loved Indivisible, a wonderful game with an amazing cast of characters. I would love to include them in our game, but Indivisible is owned by Lab Zero, and uh, what's the current situation over at Lab Zero? All right, move on. Nothing to see here. Please disperse. Nothing to see here. Ah, yes. So they're probably off the table, but okay. I know this was a long intro, but I wanted to make sure I crossed all my T's and dotted all my I's before we actually got into it, and I think we're finally clear. So ladies and gentlemen, I give you the roster for Indie Smash, the ultimate indie crossover game. Let's go ahead and get the most obvious pick out of the way. Shovel Knight. This pick is so obvious, I already mentioned him multiple times in this very video. Shovel Knight is basically the patron saint of indie games. I mean, yes, he wasn't the first indie game character to blow up, but he blew up the largest and could easily be credited with kicking off the current surge of attention the indie market is receiving. Not kidding you, when I announced on Twitter this was going to be the theme of our next Builder roster, someone literally said to me, what do you mean by indie games? Oh, like Shovel Knight? Yeah, Shovel Knight and the indie game scene go hand in hand. He has to be here. Heck, he's even the most realistic pick for a crossover game. He's already guest starred in Blade Strangers, Indie Pogo, Rivals of Aether, Ukulele, Bloodstain, and probably half a dozen other games that I don't even know about. As for how he'd fight, he'd obviously swing his shovel around for basic attacks, but he could also start digging up dirt, throwing chunks of rocks across the stage for a projectile. His shovel drop would be a great aerial attack, as it would allow him to pogo off one enemy onto another. He would also have his propeller dagger for aerial maneuverability and air recoveries. As for his super, he would blow his war horn. Any character hit by this big radial blast would be stunned as Shield Knight would race in from off screen and flip the enemy into the air, where Shield and Shovel Knight would team up for a combo attack. In fact, speaking of Shield Knight, I'd also include her in one of Shovel Knight's victory animations, where she'd float down from the sky and Shovel Knight would catch her as the announcer declares him the winner. Alright, we started off strong with a big name knight, so let's keep that ball rolling with... The Knight from Hollow Knight. Yes, another huge icon of the indie scene, Hollow Knight is basically what if Tim Burton designed a Metroidvania game starring bugs. The game has won people over with its aesthetic, fast-paced combat, and of course, the insanely marketable design of the knight himself. Even people who haven't played this game love this little guy because just look at him, he's adorable! But cute skeletal bug mascot aside, Hollow Knight has blown up on YouTube, been nominated for all kinds of awards, and recently they announced that a sequel is in the works, so there's no reason not to include him. As for his moves, he'd use his nail like a sword for his basic attacks, but for his specials, he'd be able to use the monarch wings for air recoveries. He could charge up his blade for an extended slash attack. You could also fire out the vengeful spirit fireball for a projectile, 
and we could even give him some of his dash attacks to act as rolls that could go through an opponent's attacks, sort of like his Shade Cloak ability. Also, we could give the knight a separate gauge that fills up as you attack, and you could spin that gauge to heal yourself, just like you do in the game, which might sound too good, but to do it you would have to stay still for a period of time, something that would be hard to do in a multiplayer fighting game, making it a huge risk and reward style gamble. And for his big super, he would unleash the Abyssal Shriek for a massive radial blast that would do huge damage to anyone near him as he summons out waves of shrieking souls. You know, when I uh, say things like wave of shrieking souls, it makes me question whether or not I should have gone off about how cute this guy is, but uh, oh, I can't help it. Just look at him. Also, as long as we're being morbid, here's probably my most creative idea for the little knight. Many people compare this game to Dark Souls because, yes, if you die, you have to make your way back to where you died to pick up your currency, but when you get back to that spot, you will now notice that your spoils are being protected by a vengeful spirit. And if you want to get your currency back, you will have to fight and defeat this ghostly specter. So what I'm thinking is that since this is a game where you would have stocks, meaning you die multiple times before you actually lose, maybe each time the knight died, he could spawn a specter that would attack anyone that gets near it for a limited amount of time, including the knight himself. I know the idea that your death would then spawn a counterattack might sound broken, but one thing I always say about fighting games is that ideas are not broken. Executions are. You could easily find a way to make this work without making it seem too tough. Although, speaking of things that are too tough... <laughs> Meat Boy from Super Meat Boy. Super Meat Boy was one of the earlier breakout stars of the indie scene, made famous for its insanely fast-paced platforming that made his game arguably one of the hardest of its generation. Beating Super Meat Boy became a badge of honor for gamers as you will die literally thousands of times before you reach the end. However, despite having one of the more difficult and complex platformers you could possibly get through, his moveset would be kind of simple. If you play through his game, you know that he has a bunch of punches, and that's kind of it, but those punches do propel him forward, and we could decide what direction it propels him in based on what direction you input with your special. However, I can't leave his character at just that. I do need to spice it up somehow, so here is my crazy idea for Meat Boy. How about for his down special? He would throw out one of the buzzsaw blades that covers so many of the stages from his game, and that buzzsaw would now become a stage hazard that goes back and forth across the platform that you're standing on. And you would even be able to stack these blades. You wouldn't be able to put out too many of them. You wouldn't be able to just cover the entire screen with them, but you could get maybe three, four, five blades on a single platform, which on a smaller platform would make it completely uninhabitable. And I know that a character that can create that many stage hazards sounds just flat out broken, but the downside would be that Meat Boy himself could also be damaged by these hazards. Meaning, the better you are at jumping around the arena avoiding death machines, the better you'd be at controlling Meat Boy. In other words, the better you are at playing Super Meat Boy, the better you'd be at, well, playing as Meat Boy. Philia from Skullgirls. If we're making a fighting game out of indie characters, we should probably actually grab some characters from an indie fighting game. And out of all the indie fighting games on the market, Skullgirls is easily the biggest. The game was almost at EVO. Up until EVO self-destructed and let's not talk about that anymore. Now, I know someone right now is going to say, hold up, you said that you couldn't use anyone from Indivisible because it was owned by Lab Zero and Lab Zero was also self-destructing. But Skullgirls is also owned by Lab Zero. Well, you're partly right. 
Lab Zero made Skullgirls, but that game was purchased and is now owned by Hidden Variable and Autumn Games. And after Lab Zero exploded because of stuff that is far too serious to get into in this comical video, both Hidden Variable and Autumn Games said, yeah, we still want to make more Skullgirls. And we will even hire all the employees who quit from Lab Zero to make that happen. So based on that, I would say that Skullgirls could possibly live on. And out of all the characters to pull from it, listen, I'll be honest with you. My personal favorites are Cerebella, Miss Fortune, Eliza, Big Ban, I could go on. But Felia is pretty much the face of the franchise. She's Skullgirls Ryu. You search for Skullgirls, Felia pops up. So she's who we're going to go with. And luckily, she is a fighting game character, so figuring out her moveset is easy. Just copy and paste them straight into here, adjust accordingly for the new format, and we're good to go. Juan Aguacate from Guacamele. Every fighting game needs a grappler, even a party platform fighting game. And out of the entire indie landscape, Juan Aguacate has to be the ultimate grappler. He's not just a luchador, he's probably the biggest video game luchador ever. Seriously, I can't think of anyone bigger than him. Let me know if I'm missing someone obvious, but if you want an indie wrestler in your game, you get Juan Aguacate. I could see him taking inspiration from Incineroar in Smash Bros. Ultimate with some kind of a rope bounce attack that simulates being inside of a ring, but he'd also have tons of grab moves, as well as his rising uppercut and forward head smash to send enemies flying off the screen. Also, this is a first for build the roster, but I've never had to think about what a character's taunt would be in one of these games, but for one, it has to be his ability to turn into a chicken. Just give him the dedicated turn into a chicken button it doesn't have to play into the combat in any way, shape, or form, but if you tell me that a character has the ability to turn into a chicken, I am absolutely going to find a way to work that into the game. Sash Lilac from Freedom Plant. Now we're starting to get a little more obscure, but just because the game is less known doesn't mean it isn't worth praising. Freedom Plant was a side-scrolling platformer that focused largely on speed with a playstyle that was very much a throwback to Sonic the Hedgehog, and fans of the Blue Blur certainly heaped tons of praise on. Many people hailing it as one of the best Sonic tribute games. Then again, I have seen a lot of fan-made Sonic tribute games, so, um... Yeah, it's a sliding scale. But just because the playstyle of Freedom Plant resembles Song doesn't mean that Sash would play just like him in Smash. No, she would certainly have her own unique set of moves, including her air dash or spinning attack that could serve as her up special. And for her super, she would summon out the Hollow Dragon for a laser blast across the screen, which was actually her super when she guest starred in Indie Pogo, so we already know that works as a big ultimate attack. And while we're talking about characters that are salutes to previous platform icons... Yuka and Laylee. When Yuka Laylee came out, it had some pretty high expectations behind it. The creators of Banjo Kazooie were returning to bring you the spiritual successor to that game. The internet was ablaze with hype, and when it came out, well, the results were rather divided. Some fans loved it, some thought it was outdated, and because of that, I wasn't sure I should include them. But then last year, Yuka Laylee and the Impossible Lair released to glowing praise from everyone. The fans were united, and these new mascots had a game that propelled them into stardom. Now, when it comes to their abilities, Yuka and Laylee would have some of the best variety of moves in the game. Not only can Laylee flap her wings to allow you to jump multiple times in a row, but Yuka could also stretch out their tongue for a range attack and to grab onto ledges for even more recovery options. They would also have some sonar blasts, either as a projectile or as a big radial sonar explosion move, and Yuka could curl up into a ball for a rolling attack. But perhaps the most unique thing about this character's playstyle would be that similar to Kirby, 
We could give Yuka different forms with various abilities and power-ups, such as their electric form or their fire form. And the way that they would go into these forms is that Yuka would use their tongue to eat items when they pop up on the screen, and each item would turn them into a different form. Now, next up, let's continue the string of developers who went to Kickstarter for spiritual successors with... Miriam from Bloodstained. Yes, in an attempt to show once again that Konami doesn't know what it's doing, Koji Igarashi took to Kickstarter to fund a spiritual successor to Castlevania, and what he created was one of the most fun Metroidvania games in recent memory. So let's bring the protagonist of this new franchise, Miriam, into the battle. Now, out of every character on this list, Miriam's moves would be the hardest to pick because she has dozens of abilities to pull from. Heck, we could just leave out her shard abilities completely and just have her switch between her swords, boots, guns, and whips, and she would still have a full moveset. But why would we leave out her shard abilities? They're some of her coolest abilities in the entire game. We would of course give Mirian her basic lightning blast, she could also summon out a familiar to follow her around and attack alongside her, and for her big super, she could use OD's shard power to freeze time and then jump around and attack everyone as they're stuck in place. Now Miriam ukulele, these are some pretty safe bets. But you know me, I like the weird picks. So let's move back to something surprising with... <laughs> the Nidhogg Fighters. Yes, Nidhogg is one of those games that might not look like much, but it's actually one of the most unique competitive games ever made. It's essentially a fighting game where your life bar is the progression you make from one side of the field to the other, and the mechanics are just pure footsies. And I know a lot of people might think their moves are too limited for them to work in this game, but I disagree. Remember in Nidhogg, you have tons of weapons that you can pick up and use, so each of their special moves could be these various weapons. Maybe making them something of a stance fighter, where each special move causes them to pull out a sword, or a bow, or a dagger, or whatever you have, and now their basic attacks all change to reflect that. And as for their big super, they would of course summon out the Nidhogg itself to come in off screen and gulp down any fighter in their path. Now as I said, Nidhogg might not look like a fighting game, but when you break it down, it actually sort of is. Just a very different type of one. And the fighting game community has gladly accepted this series into its fold. And you know what's another game I've seen the FGC fall in love with? Candyman from Lethal League. Lethal League is a brutally fast-paced game where players have to whack a ball back and forth at each other. A ball that ricochets off walls and continues to go faster and faster with each hit until it's practically breaking through the fabric of reality. It's incredibly popular among more competitive indie game fans and has grown enough over time to get multiple versions and has even been featured in major fighting game tournaments such as Combo Breaker. Now, when it comes to which character to pick, however, it was kind of tough. The game doesn't really have a face. It doesn't have that character that is meant to be the star. But out of all these colorful characters, I decided to go with Candyman because A, I do tend to see his Jawbreaker mug plastered around the most whenever people talk about this game, and B, in Lethal League, every character can hit the ball with their weapon, but each character has their own unique ability as well. And Candyman's ability allows him to essentially phase the ball through objects or have it teleport to another part of the field. However, in the official explanation of why he has this power, it says he can alter the properties of objects to essentially mutate them. And when I heard that, I immediately pictured what his moveset in this game would be. For his basic special, he could fire the ball across the field. And if an opponent hits the ball, it would then go back to Candyman. And if Candyman hit it, then it would speed the ball up and this would increase over and over again, just like in his game. 
But we could also give him specials, where the ball, rather than ricocheting, now inflicts status effects. Which to me lines up with this idea that Candyman has the power to alter the properties of the ball itself. And for anyone upset that we didn't fit another character in here from Lethal League, I would say for Candyman Super, he would fire out a ball. And if it hit the opponent, we would then go into a cinematic where the ball starts ricocheting off them and three other characters from Lethal League appear to hit the ball back and forth off the opponent over and over again. Cuphead. I've been trying to give a little background on each of the characters and games that we spotlight here today to try and educate anyone who doesn't know them, but, uh, do I really have to do that on this one? Does anyone not know Cuphead? His game was huge, so much so he's even about to get his own animated series. I'm actually shocked that Cuphead hasn't appeared in more games. It almost makes me wonder if the owners of this property are really protective of the title, so they don't want to let him into any other fighting games. But you know what? He got a costume in Smash Bros. So I'm taking that as the all green to put him in our Smash Bros. ripoff. The moveset of Cuphead would be super easy to figure out. Basic attacks would be little pellet blasts, sort of like Mega Man in Smash, and each of his specials would be various different specials from his game. A short range spread blast, a charge attack, we could even give him a jumping parry attack that could counter projectiles. And for his big super, I would go with his big energy beam attack to do a full screen blast. And before anyone asks, yes, Mugman would be here as an alternate skin for Cuphead. Now, I will admit I was hesitant to include Cuphead because I know they are owned by Microsoft, so even though the company that made them is still indie, Microsoft might not want to share. But there is another Microsoft-owned indie character who has had the freedom to pop up in other games, so I think it's fine. What character am I referring to, you ask? Ori. I remember when I first saw footage of Ori and the Blind Forest, I was blown away by how gorgeous it looked. I could tell it would be something special, but even I had zero idea this game would blow up and be as popular as it has. Like I said, this little guy has gotten so big, I didn't even know if it still counted as an indie tile, but after asking around, it looks like most gamers still consider it to be so, so I'm counting it. Also, we're not there yet, but with the art style and presentation of this game, we have to include Ori just so we can give them a stage in this game. That setting would be amazing to fight on. As for their abilities, they would have the Spirit Flame from the first game as a projectile attack, their Spirit Edge from the latest game for a quick combo attack, and of course they would pull out Koro's Feather and catch an updrift to let them soar high into the air, perfect for recovering from getting knocked off the stage. Now, as I said, Ori feels like a safe bet here, like Microsoft would allow them to be in this game, because they have guest starred in another indie platform fighter. What game am I talking about? <laughs> Zetterburn from Rivals of Aether. Rivals of Aether is a fairly popular platform fighting game that many have said is reminiscent of Smash Bros, so you can probably see where this is going. However, just like Lethal League, it was kinda hard picking one character because Rivals of Aether doesn't really have a face. It doesn't have a main character. But I'm going to go with Zaterburn because I feel like if you want something that screams fighting game featuring animals powered by the elements, you go with the lion on fire. And honestly, this is another character who is super easy to figure out, probably more so than any other character on this list because as I said, he's already from a platform fighter game with control schemes that are meant to be similar to Smash. This is as copy and paste as you can possibly copy and paste. Give him his big flame burst, fireball projectiles, and as I mentioned with Candyman, we would have status effects in this game such as poison or burn to try and give our game a bit more uniqueness compared to our Smash sibling, so let Zaterburn keep his burn status effect that would damage enemies over time while giving him a power boost. Easy, done, moving on. 
Otis from Owlboy. I loved Owlboy when it came out, and just speaking personally, it kind of bums me out that it feels like this game has largely been forgotten over the years. I mean, Shovel Knight, Nidhogg, Ukulele, everyone remembers and still talks about these games to this day, but it feels like Owlboy has fallen off a lot of people's radars. Well, if this is my game, then you know I have to put this adorable little flyboy back into the spotlight. Now in Owlboy, Otis flies around a world of floating islands, so of course he would be another character with multiple jumps and an air dash to help him recover from falling off of platforms, and as for how he'd attack, he would use his basic spin attacks, but for each of his specials, he would summon out his friends Getty and Alphonse for projectile attacks. In fact, for his big super, Otis would grab Getty and carry him around the ring for a period of time as he continuously fires at everything. Now, as I said, I love Otis. I think he is an insanely charming bird-themed character who is so sweet and wholesome. So it's only fair that our next fighter is another bird-themed character who is the complete opposite of that. Stop me if you've heard this one before. Bad guy crashes party, kidnaps princess, makes dramatic exit. Plucky handsome hero gives chase. Epic quest ensues. But funny story. Yeah, I'm the bad guy. Crow from Nefarious. Nefarious is a platformer where you play as the bad guy. Your crow, fresh from his latest plan to kidnap the princess, only for the hero of the game to show up and say, yeah, I'm kind of done with this. So now, Crow sets out on a quest to travel from one video game world to another to kidnap their princesses. So long story short, he's a video game character who jumps over into other video game worlds. And I've always felt like if you're making a crossover game and you have a character whose entire gimmick is they jump from one world to another, you kind of have to include them in said crossover game. In fact, I'd almost say that we should go ahead and make him the big villain of the entire game. It would make sense. Except that makes so much sense that Indie Pogo literally already did that. Again, I'll just take this opportunity to say, check out Indie Pogo. It's, uh, it's pretty darn good. The Beheaded from Dead Cells The Beheaded, or The Prisoner, or The Fallen One, whichever name you want to use, is the protagonist of Dead Cells, one of the biggest roguelike indie games of the past few years. But even beyond just popularity, I have to include The Beheaded because A, he has an amazing design. Seriously, this guy looks cool in every art style. And B, if you're from a roguelike game, you have no lack of moves and abilities we can use in a fighting game. There are countless blunt weapons and whips and bows and arrows that you can use in this game, and part of the fun of Dead Cells is picking up these random weapons and seeing which one suits you or works the best for each occasion. So maybe we could make Beheaded something of a gimmick character, where he would have to cycle through randomly generated weapons, and certain weapons would be better against specific characters. Think of it like this. Remember Phoenix Wright in Marvel vs. Capcom 3, and how he had a button that allowed him to search for clues, but only specific clues would be the ones that you need in that round against that enemy? But if you got all three correct clues, he could then go into his superpowered turnabout mode? Same thing here. Give Beheaded a button where he pulls out a random weapon, but if you don't like it, then you would have to hit another button to drop that weapon. So then, you could hit that first button again to search for a different weapon until you found the one that you wanted to use. You could have a sword, whip, and bow weapon, each with their own search command, and you could get a basic weapon that would have average damage and average speed, but maybe you could pull out a heavy weapon that would have stronger attacks, but they would be much slower. Or you could find some weapons that poison your foes or burns them, but they would do less basic damage compared to your average weapon. I know it might sound crazy to put the random loot element of a roguelike game into a fighting game, but 
hey, if Smash Bros can put in a crafting mechanic for Steve from Minecraft, we can totally put this mechanic in here for Dead Cells. And speaking of crazy mechanics... <laughs> I don't know how I survived that fall. Something strange must have happened. My pulse is beating like a drum, but my blood is running cold. I'm not sure what's going on, but I came here with a question. And I'm gonna find the answer if it kills me. Cadence from Crypt of the Necrodancer. Crypt of the Necrodancer is a rhythm-based dungeon crawler meaning that you have to move and attack to the beat of the music. Sounds like a crazy idea, right? Well, if you know me and have been paying attention so far this episode, you know that I love crazy ideas. For Cadence, I'd try to incorporate this playstyle into her combat. Her basic attack power and movement speed would be, eh, kind of, well, basic. Kind of right down the middle, a total 5 out of 10, nothing special to see here, folks. But let's say that whenever you hit an attack button, you would have a little note come off of Cadence, and then those notes would continue to come off her in a rhythm. And if you follow your attack up with another attack in sync with those notes, your attacks would do more damage, and the notes would change colors if you hit the pattern correctly. For example, you could run up to someone and hit the attack button and then follow that up with a combo like 1, 2, 3, 4, and it would do basic damage. But if you hit the attack and follow it up in the rhythm of 1, 2, 3, for, in order to match the notes that are coming off of Cadence, then it would do extra damage. You could also have these notes appear after certain actions, like doing a perfect block or a roll, so you could use this pattern to counterattack as well. Again, I realize that this sounds overly complex, and it would be. Cadence would easily be one of the hardest characters to use. You would only be able to main her if you were dedicated enough to learn every bit of her frame data. Luckily, this is a fighting game. And there is indeed a portion of the fighting game community that lives for memorizing frame data. So if you're in that audience, this would be the character for you. The Drifter from Hyperlight Drifter. Haunting, iconic, and stylish as hell, Hyperlight Drifter is a beacon of art mixed with action and cemented itself in the hearts of many gamers. I mean, just look at this opening cutscene and, well, I'm not going to say this game is going to be for everyone, but if it is for you, this game is going to hit you hard and fast. But enough selling, how would the Drifter actually play? He would kind of be like a mix between Link and Fox, a sword master mixed with tech. He would have his spinning charge attack, his dash strike attack, but he could also bring out his guns for range attacks, and we could also take his dash shield from his game and use it as a reflective barrier that sends opponent's projectiles back at them. This sounds pretty simple and basic, but did you hear my description for Cadence? Yeah, we need to start balancing out some of these complex gimmick characters with some more basic and straightforward characters, so if you don't want to learn any crazy gimmicks for your character and you want just your basic sword and gun guy, that's the Drifter. Now, taking the stage from parts beyond, part two, part magic, the shimmering stars of the evening, they are your spectacular Shantae. This one was a hard choice because Shantae is incredibly popular. In fact, she's so popular, I didn't know if she still counted as an indie character. Her games get bigger and bigger with each installment. In fact, in the last game, they even had an opening cutscene by legendary anime studio Trigger. That's a pretty big achievement for an indie game. Plus, there's the whole matter of the fact that even though she's now owned by WayForward, she did originally premiere as a Nintendo game. But I asked around the internet, and much to my delight, it seems like most people primarily think of her as an indie star, so she gets it. Now, when it comes to her powers, she would have a lot of options to choose from. Her basic attacks would of course be her hair whip, and for her standing special, we could pick one of the offensive items that you can use in her game, such as the fireball. 
But for her directional specials, she would use her transformation powers. For her side special, she would transform into an elephant and charge across the stage. The Harby form would be her up special, which would allow her to fly back onto the stage. And for her down special, she would turn into her crab form and pinch her claws for a knockdown attack that would hit opponents on both sides of her. And as for her big super, she would call upon the other half genies introduced in Seven Sirens to all concentrate their magic together for a huge blast attack. Arizona from them's fighting herds. I said before, I'll say it again, if you have an indie fighting game, there's a good chance that we'll include you in our indie crossover fighting game. And them's fighting herds? Okay, yes. On the outside, it looks like a cutesy My Little Pony stand-in. Because that's exactly what it is. Yes, to anyone who doesn't know, them's fighting herds started off as a fan-made My Little Pony fighting game. Only for the company that owns said magical horses to step in and say, uh, we don't really want our characters fighting each other. So these developers then decided to turn this into their own original game. And what they created was a game with such solid mechanics, inventive online and single player modes, and stellar netcode that it was actually going to be at EVO this year until once again you know how this story goes. Now, this is yet another game that doesn't really have a main character, it doesn't have a face, but you do start the story mode off with Arizona. She is your introduction to the game, as well as being arguably the most balanced fighter, so she's who I'm picking. But don't worry, for her big super, we could easily include all the other fighters from this game and have them pop up to help her stampede over the opponent. Quote from Cave Story. I mentioned earlier that Shovel Knight wasn't the first indie game to blow up, but it did probably have the largest blow up. So many of you might be asking, well, then what was the first indie game to blow up? Well, that's something of a vague question. I think most people are going to have their own criteria for what meets the answer to it. However, after looking around on the internet, most people tend to be divided on what was the first big indie game, but most people tend to agree that Cave Story in 2004 kicked off the modern era of indie games. And even though this game is over 16 years old at this point, it's not like it or the characters within it have been forgotten over the years. As I said, I've always dreamed of the perfect indie crossover game, but it's not like there haven't been indie crossover games. I've mentioned plenty throughout this video, and many of the ones I mentioned featured Curly and Quote. So you better believe these two are making it into our game. And yes, as I said, we would have Curly and Quote both in the game, but not as Ice Climber style duo characters. No, they would just simply be two skins for the same character slot as a way to sneak in an extra character. I know some people will argue that shouldn't work because Curly and Quote, while sharing some abilities, also have their own unique powers. True, but it's kind of unfair to pick between the two of them, and at the end of the day, they would both play as zoners with a wide variety of weapons, so I'd be fine with taking some of their individual abilities and splitting it between the two of them. Good morning, and welcome to yet another day of space adventure. You are only Five light years away from your destination. Oh. Hat Kid from A Hat in Time. Not going to lie, I love A Hat in Time. It is a crazy charming 3D platformer reminiscent of the Nintendo 64 era of collectathons, loaded with wit and humor, and a lot of that is thanks to the attitude of our star, Hat Kid. She looks all sweet and adorable on the outside, but on the inside, she's basically pure chaotic neutral, which, as we all know, is the best kind of neutral. I mean, this kid is low with so much personality, I need to include her in this roster just for the windscreen animations and taunts alone. Now, Hat Kid, as I said, is from one of those old school collectathon platformers, I mean, of course, she has a bunch of crazy abilities that we could easily use for her moves. Her basic attacks would come from her umbrella, but for her up special, she could whip out her hook shot, which would be great for grabbing onto ledges when you fall off the side. For her side special, she could bring out her scooter and ride across the stage. Her basic special would be her throwing out an explosive magical vial, and her down special would be her counter where she uses her time stop hat to slow the opponent. 
As for her big super, she would pull off her hat, and her frenemy, the Snatcher, would come out and start dropping explosive vials everywhere, which would also give us an opportunity to put his boss fight song in here, and I am all in favor of that because that tune is a banger. Zagreus from Hades. We've got a lot of older series on here, but you can't build a crossover game on just the classics. You need that new hotness. And when it comes to the modern day massive indie hit, you're talking about Hades. Now this is another roguelike game where you use a variety of power-ups that change with each time that you play through it, but we already tried to reproduce that with the behead, so I don't want to fall back on that gimmick more than we have to. So instead, for Zagreus, I'm going to stick with his most iconic powers and weapons. His basic attacks would all come from his sword, the Stygian Blade, and each of his specials would be him calling on the powers of the gods. His up special would see a splash of war from Poseidon propelling Zagreus into the air. His down special would be a counter where he brings up Athena's shield to reflect projectiles. His side special would be a blade rift from Ares, and his neutral special would be the Stygian Blade's ability where he can slam it into the ground to create a radial blast. And for his big super, he would call upon Zeus, who would bombard the screen with lightning blasts. Now, we only have one last slot, and we have covered a lot of games that are considered some of the biggest indie games ever. Games that blew up and broke into the mainstream, built up huge fan bases, and have become legendary gaming icons. But if we are talking about big indie games, games that were practically cultural phenomenons, then there is one title that is still missing. Our final character is... Sands from Undertale. Yeah, I said that Shovel Knight has probably blown up and had a bigger impact than any other indie game, but Undertale is maybe half an inch behind it. It is a photo finish to see which is bigger. And when it comes to who to include from this game, it was a tough choice. Up until Sans got put in Smash Bros. as a costume, then yeah, it kind of became obvious. However, what isn't obvious is how to interpret his boss fight and moves into making him a playable character, since boss fights in Undertale are very unique. In Undertale, when you enter combat, it basically involves the character putting your soul into a box that you then have to maneuver around inside of. Obviously, that doesn't quite work in a platform fighter, so we're going to have to take his mechanics and... think outside the box? What? Don't look at me like that, I'm talking about Sans here, I had to sneak a bad pun in somewhere. For his neutral special, he would throw a bone across the stage that the opponent would have to jump over. For his side special, he would fire a laser beam from his Gaster Blaster. And for his down special, it would be a grab where he lifts the opponent into the air and then slams them back into the ground, since he loves to toss your little soul heart against the wall during the battle. As for his up special, well, it's hard to think of something we could use for an aerial recovery move, since as I said, Undertale bosses don't really move around. So I'd say let's have Sans' brother Papyrus appear for his special, and he gives Sans a boost, helping to lift him into the air for a super jump. And as for his big ultimate super move, he would turn the entire screen into the bullet board from Undertale, and he would mimic his opening attack of his battle, where bones fly in from both sides, and then huge gaster blasters fire across the screen. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, your starting roster for the ultimate indie crossover game. Arizona, The Beheaded, Cadence, Candyman, Crow, Cuphead, Curly and Quote, The Drifter, Philia, 
Pet Kid, Hollow Knight, Juan Aguacate, Meat Boy, Miriam, Nidhog, Ori, Otis, Sans, Sash Lilac, Shantae, Shovel Knight, Ukulele, Zagreus, and Zaderburn. However, if you've watched this show before, you know I can never leave it at just the roster. No, I always have to throw out a handful of other crazy ideas just to spice it up before I go. And as I have said it so many times, you're probably all getting sick of it by now. This massive indie crossover, in my mind, will play just like Smash. And that's not just because I think that a platform fighter is the best fit for so many varied characters and art styles, but because Smash doesn't stop at just the roster. They cram more characters and games in here wherever they can. And one of the best ways that they are able to do that is with the assist characters. Yes, one of the ways that Smash is able to sneak in bonus characters is through the assist trophies, where you call upon a bonus character to help you out for a limited amount of time. This has allowed them to include tons of characters who wouldn't have worked as full-fledged fighters, either for mechanical reasons, because they weren't big enough to warrant a slot, or because they would have flooded the roster with too many characters from the same franchise. And that's exactly what we're going to do here, because remember what I said earlier about how there are tons of indie icons who are popular or important to the gaming landscape, but they probably wouldn't work in a fighting game? Yeah, this is where we fit those characters in. In fact, because this episode is going long, and I say that even by the standards of our other episodes, which is really saying something, but because we are going long, I am not going to list off any assist characters who would come from the same games as characters we already have on this roster. Although, I will just say real quickly, you better believe that the Order of No Quarter from Shovel Knight, Risky Boots from Shantae, and DJ Grooves from A Hat in Time are must-haves as assist trophies. But we don't have time to go any further than that. So we're just going to focus right now on the assist characters who are from franchises that haven't already appeared on this list, and we'll even go in alphabetical order just to make it easier. First up, and arguably the biggest get for this list, the crewmates from Among Us. Yeah, this game has been so huge this year, I had to put them in here somewhere. And as an assist trophy, they would work great. Imagine this, you open up the assist trophy, and three of these little crew members pop out and they just start wandering around the stage. Not attacking, not bothering you. No, they're just walking around doing their task. But one of these three crew members is an imposter. And if an enemy stands next to them for too long, the imposter will instantly KO them and take one of their life stocks. Next up is Baba. If you don't know who this character is, you might find yourself asking, okay, what is Baba? Answer, yes. This is the little mascot of the game Baba is You, and in that game, you make Baba go up to words and manipulate them to change the environment in order to solve puzzles. So essentially, when Baba is released, a bunch of words will appear on the stage, and Baba will run around shoving the words together, and these words will result in attacks. For example, you could have one word be another player, then another word is explode. For example, let's say that you're playing as Shovel Knight, and your opponent picks up the assist trophy, and Baba comes out. Now, all of a sudden, your name is going to appear on one part of the stage, and the word EXPLODE will appear on the other part of the stage. And Baba will go up to your name, and start slowly shoving it towards the word EXPLODE, and you will have to decide, do I keep fighting my opponent, or do I go up to this name, and try and hit the block away? Because if Baba ends up connecting the word Shovel Knight to the word EXPLODE, then all of a sudden Shovel Knight will burst into flames and go flying off the stage. Now, this is just one example, but Baba could also inflict status effects, debuffs, there's a wide variety to abilities that you could give Baba through these word manipulations. Next up is Carrion, the giant fleshy thing style monster from the game of the same name that came out earlier this year. In Carry On, your controls are pretty simple, but chaotically fun, as you roll and swing and slither your way across the stage, basically just eating anyone you find or flinging them around like ragdolls. Which is basically what Carry On would do here. You would release them from the trophy, and then they would just start wildly running around grabbing players with their tentacles and flinging them off the stage. They would be moving in such a strange and bizarre pattern, it would be so hard to predict making them one of the most insane assist characters you could get in this game. The moment they come out, everyone would just stop fighting as they would try and desperately try and run from this thing, which is basically what all the humans have to do in Carry On. But if you are really low on health, 
that it wouldn't grab you and throw you off the stage, it would just straight up eat you to instantly KO one of your livestocks. Next up, another big hit from earlier this year, Fall Guys. You'd pick up the assist trophy, it would burst open, but nothing would come out. Instead, you would slowly start to hear this crazy poppy music start playing in the background as a crowd begins to cheer, and then a herd of Fall Guys would come running in from off screen, jumping and bumping all over the place, trying to get from one end of the stage to the next, and if you get caught up in them, it would basically be like getting hit by a tidal wave of tiny little bean men. Yes, you can fight back, yes, you can jump and run through them, but there would be so many of them, and they would be pushing against you so hard, and they would be flipping and flopping all over the place, so if you're not fighting back as hard as you can, they are going to grab you, and they are going to push you off the edge of that stage. Next up, the character I can only assume many of you have been screaming for this entire time. Yes, I know many of you had to be thinking, the goose has to be in here, right? Well, believe me, I tried to think of a way to make them a fighter. But the goose from Untitled Goose Game doesn't really have a lot of combat abilities. Because the goose doesn't want to fight anyone. It just wants to mess with them, which is exactly what it would do here. The goose would pop out of the trophy case, and then they would just start wallowing about the stage. Honking at enemies, causing them to freeze for a moment, which would leave them wide open to an attack. But more importantly, they would also force the character that they honk at to drop whatever item that they're holding, as the goose would then grab that item and carry it off the screen, never to be heard from again. Now for something completely different, the Huntress from Dead by Daylight. Dead by Daylight is huge, one of the biggest, most successful indie games of all time, and is continuing to grow with new characters to this day, which actually made this a really hard choice. You see, I wanted to put someone from this game in here, but which character to choose? There are too many good grabs. Heck, we could have done our own Dead by Daylight fighting game instead of just making one of them a guest character. Hmm. Quick mental note for next year's Halloween episode, and moving on. But in the end, I went with Huntress. She was the first really big DLC character to come to this game, and with her axe throw, she would have some great range for her assist moves. But also, if she hits you with your axe, it would cause that character to become stunned, at which point she would run up to you, grab you, and try and carry you off the stage for a KO, unless another player was nice enough to fight her off while she was carrying you forcing her to drop you, which would take the teamwork elements of Dead by Daylight and implement them in our fighting game. Okay, time to be fun and silly again. Our next assist is the Kerbals from Kerbal Space Program. These little guys come from a spaceship simulator game that is actually quite educational as it uses real science to help teach people about the various factors to consider in spaceship design. We will not be doing anything educational with them in this game though, as they will pop free of their assist trophy and then instantly start building a makeshift rocket ship that will fly into the air and then come spiraling back down to create a huge explosion. Now these next characters are ones that to me embody the idea of iconic character doesn't really work in a fighting game, and that's very ironic because this next character actually comes from a fighting game. Die kick! Kick from Dive Kick. Now, Dive Kick is actually a very interesting game because not only is it a one hit only fighting game, meaning the moment you take one hit, you instantly lose, but also in Dive Kick, you can only do two things you can dive and you can kick. That's it. One button makes you jump, one button makes you kick back down. This game has a solid group of fans in the FGC that applaud it for being so different and loaded with mind games, so because of that I really wanted to include the face of the series, Kick, but yeah, as I said, you can only dive kick in the game. How do you interpret that into a game where your character now has to have a super move, at least four different special moves, smash moves for every single direction? It just didn't really work out. Hell, you can't even walk in Dive Kick. How am I supposed to implement that in here? But if he's an assist trophy, boom. He pops out and just starts jumping and kicking his way across the screen, sending anyone he hits bouncing away. Next assist character, Madeline from Celeste. 
Celeste was a major hit for the indie community when it released a few years ago, and the reason it had such a huge impact was partly thanks to the quick frame perfect platforming that made it a joy for people wanting a challenge and speedrunners alike, but more importantly, it was thanks to how personal the story was. The game focuses on Madeline, who is attempting to climb to the top of Mount Celeste in hopes of getting in touch with herself. But as you go along, she has to face her own depression and anxiety, which is constantly telling her to turn back. As I said, this game was a big hit, so I did want to include her, but the more I thought about, the more I realized she just didn't really work. Madeline isn't a fighter. In fact, her entire journey is meant to be sort of about finding personal peace and helping others. So as an assist trophy, that's exactly what she would do. She would appear and toss out a strawberry, one of the collectibles that you can find in her game, and whoever summoned her could then eat that strawberry to recover a large chunk of health. Almost done, and for our penultimate assist character, it's Octodad. Yes, Octodad is a fun, wacky personality who I would love to see clash with these other fighters, but did you play Octodad? Literally the entire point of the gameplay in Octodad is that because you control every part of him separately, it's meant to be chaotically uncontrollable. And if you put a character whose entire gimmick is you can't control them well into a fighting game, either you're going to create a fighter who isn't true to the initial character, or you're going to create the worst fighter imaginable. Even as a joke character, he would be just too cruel. So Octodad will unfortunately have to sell for being an assist trophy, who would flip and flop around the stage with his sticky tentacles, and if he crossed your path, he would then stick onto you. And while he's attached to your character, your controls would be greatly exaggerated or stunted, either making you run in place or slide everywhere. Essentially, making your character far harder to control, just like Octodad. And for the final assist character, as I said, we were going in alphabetical order, but even still, it is really appropriate that we're going out on this fighter. Zubaz, aka The Baz. Now, I'm sure many of you right now are looking at me going, what? While the rest of you are shouting, yes. Let me explain. The Baz was a character created by the YouTubers, The Super Best Friends, based upon a sketch for an unused character from Street Fighter 2. Originally, he was just a joke that they kept bringing up as if he was real, but they kept doing it so many times that eventually, well, he kind of became real. The Super Best Friends started pushing for him to be in numerous indie games as a guest character, having him appear in Dive Kick, Indivisible, and even Shovel Knight. In other words, the Baz has no game of his own. Instead, he has established himself as being a recurring guest character in indie games. And since the assist trophies would be guest characters for our indie game, this is kind of the perfect place for him. I know that someone might say, well, yeah, but he's owned by the Super Best Friends, and didn't they break up? Yes, but from what I understand, they have some kind of an understanding about Zubaz and about how he can be used. Meaning that no matter what happens, the Baz will continue to live on. So there you have it, 24 characters and 11 assist characters. I think we have done enough for today. This is easily more than anyone could ask for in a hypothetical fighting game. Anyone but me, that is. There is one more element that is important to truly capturing the crossover element that makes a game like Smash so special. The stages. Yes, this is a platform fighter that will be loaded with stage hazards and various crossover elements sprinkled about, so the stages will have almost as much character as the fighters themselves. I mean, the last Smash Bros. had over 100 stages. They clearly realized the importance of using them for crossover fan service. So of course, we will be doing the same here, and we can already assume that every single character in this game is going to get their own stage, so there isn't much need to talk about those. So once again, let's focus on some stages built around characters and games that didn't make it in already. Again, we will be going in alphabetical order, so first up is the Binding of Isaac. You'd be inside a dark, dingy dungeon as various bugs skitter around in the background. As for stage hazards, I picture this level being sort of like the dark version of that one WarioWare level in Smash, where you have to avoid the mother when she checks in on you, except in this game, the mom in question is Isaac's mom, meaning she would occasionally bring a giant leg down to try and step on you. Okay, now for this next stage, I did mention that I was going to talk about stages from games that didn't already have a fighter represented, but I didn't say anything about assist characters. 
So that's why our next stage is the titular mountain from Celeste. This would be a moving stage, as you and all the other characters would have to fight each other while the stage scrolls upwards, forcing all of you to have to climb to the top. In fact, maybe if you reach the top, Madeline could be waiting up there for you, and she would throw a healing strawberry to whichever character reached the top first. Now going back to the creepy horror locations, next up, it's... Of the Darkest Dungeon. I mean, you want to talk about a game where the location is the star? The Darkest Dungeon is literally the title of the game. We are looking at a creepy, crawling, gothic setting here as we would try to bring the absolute gorgeous art style of this game to life in a 3D setting. As for stage hazards, one of the defining gameplay elements of Darkest Dungeon is that your characters can become so stressed from the horrors they've seen that they can go mad, suffering from various negative status effects based upon what conditions they end up contracting. So, for the Darkest Dungeon stage, there would be monsters in the background that would toss various items onto the stage that would inflict negative status effects on any character that runs past them. Now for our next stage, we are going to escape the horrors of the Darkest Dungeon for... another horror video game. What can I say, we're going in alphabetical order. The tones here are kind of out of my hands. If we're talking about games with famous locations, this next one is probably the biggest of any indie game ever. Fazbear's Pizza from Five Nights at Freddy's. Yeah, you can't deny it, this game was massive when it came out. Heck, several YouTubers practically built their careers around it. A whole wave of jump scare based horror games sprung up around it. And to this day, it still has new installments coming out despite about three different installments promising to be the end of the series. But hey, you try and say no to all the money in the world. I can't blame them for making more. In fact, this game is so big, I almost put old Fazbear himself in here, but in the end, it was way too hard to figure out his moves. All he really does is jump out of a door and scare you. Which is exactly what we need for a stage hazard. Yeah, this one is pretty self-explanatory. Put two doors on both sides of the stage, and occasionally a random animatronic monster will pop out and send any character standing next to the door flying. In fact, if you want to get creative, we could also make it so that each time a character is KO'd, you would see stuff on the stage start to change. After a couple characters get KO'd, a random poster against the wall changes and is replaced by a picture of Golden Freddy. Balloon Boy slowly slides in the frame. Or throughout the match with every single KO, the speaker could suddenly crackle to life and your supervisor would come on with a different message. After the first couple KOs, he would come on and say, Uh, yeah, so just a heads up, there's some new animatronics in there. Uh, they tell me that every now and again they just start fighting each other, but if that happens and I was you, I would just stay out of their way and let them do their work, okay? But when you get down to the final couple life stocks and the game is about to end, he could come out with one last message, which is just a bunch of vague demonic gargles that would provide video game theory based YouTubers with years and years of content as they try and decipher what it could all mean and how it could fit into all the other games. Next up, Hades was a huge hit this year with an amazing roguelike experience, but it wasn't the only new indie roguelike game to get a heaping ton of praise thrown upon it. Going Under was also released this year, and it's another game that was very tempting to put a character onto this list, but even if I couldn't slide Jacqueline in here, I still wanted to give the game some representation. So we'll give it a stage set in the dystopian tech startup future of Neo Cascadia, and since Going Under is a game where you can pick up anything and use it as a weapon, this stage won't really have stage hazards but it will have a ton of breakable set pieces, and inside each breakable item will be a weapon that your character can pick up and use. Okay, I've got one more spooky scary stage for you, and for this next one, we are heading to the weird German art film landscape that is Limbo. Now for stage hazards, of course, it has to be the giant spider that occasionally comes in off stage to skewer the player with its giant legs. But, I think that we could get even more creative with this stage. The defining characteristic about Limbo was the art style, it was that black and white silhouette aesthetic. So maybe, when you play on this stage, an option would pop up to turn the limbo filter on or off. And if you turn it on, then all of your characters would be solid black silhouettes. Since this would be in effect for the entire match and could really screw up some players, as I said, it would be an optional setting when you select the stage. But I think it would be a perfect way to work the tone and aesthetic of limbo into this game. Okay, that's it. That was the last and final spooky stage, I promise. Well, kind of. Because next up is Spooky High from Monster Prom. 
I love Monster Prom. I have raved about it many times. It is one of the funniest video games I have ever played, giving me hours and hours of laugh out loud enjoyment. And I love these characters. Trust me, if I could find a way to squeeze a character from a dating sim into this fighting game, I totally would have. But instead, we'll just have to settle for a stage set in the school's cafeteria where the various students of Spooky High will be cheering you on in the background. And by cheering, I mean constantly throwing items onto the stage. Most of them would be weapons to use against each other because if there's one thing that the students of Spooky High love, it is unnecessary violence. But every now and again, we could also have Juan, the small magical Latino cat, fly overhead and drop onto the stage some of his custom cocktails to give you various status effects. Next stage comes from Overcooked. Overcooked is one of the most fun and simultaneously hectic co-op games I have ever played and I love it. I am a huge fan of this series, so I had to give it some representation, and Overcooked was born to be a stage. The whole point of Overcooked is that you're trying to serve up food and then deliver it to the paying customers, but each stage contains crazy obstacles that keep popping up in your way. So we would set the stage in a parking lot where several food trucks are lined up ready to serve customers, and said customers would keep walking in front of you and blocking your path as you try and fight. Or a new truck would pull up and block off one side of the stage. Or perhaps we could have various chefs stationed on each of the platforms, but just like in the game, the platforms would keep shifting and sliding around. In fact, one of the cooks could accidentally set some dishes on fire, and while that fire is raging on that platform, it would be unsafe to stand there. There is a lot that we could do with this stage, but the most important thing to remember is that with the overcooked stage, you would constantly have to pay attention to how the environment is always shifting and changing. Now for a stage that, well, doesn't really have anything too difficult to it, but sure going to have one heck of a gimmick. The Office from the Stanley Parable. The Stanley Parable is sort of an interactive story where you can basically decide to do whatever you want. But the big appeal of it is that whatever you do in there, there will be a narrator who describes everything that is happening. Almost as if serving as a foil or even straight up villain to our protagonist at times. Eager to get back to business, Stanley took the first open door on his left. Stanley was so bad at following directions, it's incredible he wasn't fired years ago. So, for this stage, yeah, it would be one of the most basic designs. No real stage hazards to speak of, maybe every now and again the background could shift as if you are moving to a new part of this game, but everything that you do would be described by the narrator from the Stanley Parable in that dry whip that made the game so famous. Next up, another titular location loaded with personality, Stardew Valley. This stage would be a little bit different because there wouldn't exactly be stage hazards, instead this would almost be the exact opposite of the Darkest Dungeon stage, because while on that stage monsters would throw items that inflict you with negative status effects, on the Stardew Valley stage, the villagers in the background would throw items that give you positive status effects. Stardew Valley is meant to be a peaceful, relaxing game about people coming together and helping each other out, so let's take that same attitude and bring it to this stage. And for the final stage, Tricky Towers. Tricky Towers is a stacking game that's basically Tetris mixed with pure chaos. You try to build a tower made of blocks that are constantly falling over, so that's exactly what the stage would be. The stage would slowly start building upon itself as new platforms fall from the sky and stack on top of the last platform, meaning that you would have to jump up to the newly formed platform as the camera slowly scrolls upwards, but every now and again, a new platform wouldn't land just right. It wouldn't stick. So after it lands, it would slowly start to tip over and you would have to jump back down to a lower platform before you fall off. But that is it. 24 characters, 11 assists, 11 stages, not including of course the obvious ones based upon each fighter. I think it is now safe to say we have created the most stuffed, jam-packed, hypothetical indie fighting game you could possibly dream of. There is nothing left to cover. Except for items. No, I'm just kidding, we're not going to talk about the items. Even for me, that is way too much to go over. Although, maybe we could cover the potential DLC real quickly? No, 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 that's, we have gone on long enough, so instead we're just going to cut it here. Thank you to everyone who joined us and stuck with us for this massive undertaking. As I have said numerous times, creating the ultimate indie crossover fine game has always been something of a dream of mine. 
So I know this episode might not have appealed to as many people out there as our normal Build the Roster episodes, but I hope that for those indie Smash fans out there, this video tickled your fancy, gave you some fun hypotheticals to geek out over, and made you think about all the possibilities a game like this could have. And if you're not a big indie gamer and you just tuned in because you were curious, well then I hope that I was able to sell you on some of these games and made you curious enough to check them out. I know I went into far more descriptions of the games that these characters came from than I normally do on this show, but as I said, I love indie games. And by their definition, indie games tend to be smaller. They tend to be games that don't really get as much attention as the big AAA titans. So I wanted to use this episode to hopefully expose someone out there to a game that they might never have heard of and make them want to check it out. If you decide to try any of the games that we spotlight here today, let me know in the comments down below what you think of them. Also, let me know who would you want to see in an indie crossover game. Thank you again for tuning in today, everyone. Coming up next month is our big 2020 retrospective where we will be counting down our favorite games and characters and moments of the year. And then after that, Build the Roster will return for a whole new year of big hypothetical fighting game fun. So if you want to see any of that, then hit that subscribe button and ring that bell so that way you don't miss out on any future episode. Have a happy holiday season, everyone. Stay safe out there, and I will see you in the new year.